Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Vic, and uh, thanks to the DVSA for having me um, here today. This is a dream come true in many ways for me, because when I moved to Hamilton, it was a dream for me to come here and do a course at the DVSA at some point, but then life got really busy, and I, I had kids, and you know, and so uh, time went on, and, and it's great to be here now just talking about my art at the DVSA. Um, so thank you again for <coughs> coming out on a beautiful uh, Friday afternoon, the sun shining outside, and spending time here with me. I'll be quick, I promise. Um, so, um, the words, I'm an artist, when I say who I am, people ask me, what are you? And I, I always say, you know, I'm an artist. And over the years, I've had many titles that I've kept. I've been a designer, I've been a photographer, a filmmaker, but nothing or no other title rang as true as saying that I'm an artist. The words, I'm an artist, really rings true inside, and it kind of brings you a lot of fulfillment and joy, and so now, over the years that I've had all those titles, I'm an artist is my title, and I love saying that to people when they ask me what I do. So today I hope I can you know, bring a few points across on how that transpired over the years and how my journey went across from being a graphic designer to a self-taught artist and then having shows and doing art you know, on a full-time basis probably. I'd like to start off by playing a quick video that should give you, you know, a, a really good idea of my process and my, my work. This was done at the Hamilton Art Council residency last year. Hi, my name is Vic, and I'm an artist. This recent series of paintings are probably the most important ones I've made to date. A culmination of a personal and professional journey undertaken over a decade. These works were conceptualized during my residency at the Hamilton Art Council studio within the Garden Factory. They are rendered in a voice that engages my love for bright colors and superimposes them onto more nostalgic subject matter. In a way, they are maybe a reflection of how I have processed the events of my life to this day. These paintings also mark a return to painting large scale in oil, something I had given up quite recently. So I've been painting as long as I can remember and trying to express things within me. Painting always came more naturally and I could speak naturally through painting more than my own voice. As I stand in the Hamilton Art Council studio within the cotton factory, I realize that a, a big dream for me has come true being here. Through this residency, my aim was to challenge myself to stretch out and investigate individual aspects of my practice and maybe learn new ways to approach my work than I have in the past. This included a restart in my practice in oil while also working in acrylics. Trying out completely new start and end points and aiming to complete a large body of work within six months. I'm hoping this change in pace of process mixed in with a change of environment helps to reflect truly my themes of displacement belonging and identity within my works.
So my process usually seesaws between analog and digital worlds, with each competing with each other for space, where the analog usually always wins at the end. This journey that the work undertakes is highly rewarding for me. And it is in this translation that I find my voice for the piece. It somehow also mirrors our current state of society, which alternates between being a digitally functioning entity and a flesh and bones human being. The struggle of keeping these two worlds functioning cohesively is the space I'm trying to represent through my paintings. You will see figures in these paintings surrounded by abstracted situations that also interact with the figures in a way. These are metaphorical narratives, analogies in nature that circle sort of represent a situation in abstracted form. The act of painting for me is a peaceful process of creation which allows me space and time for deep contemplation. My paintings usually start out with a background that is painted and texturized to mirror human fingerprints, but they may also look like sound waves traversing a plane. It is a process that is very physical and expressive in nature. This immediately grounds the painting for me and I can approach it without judgment or criticism. As the painting gets covered in paint, many parts of this rich background remain exposed, letting lines shine through and balance out the hyper-real motifs being painted over. I often play with the shapes of these waves to position my subjects organically within the space. These paintings themselves are inspired by a need to resolve distant memories and the effect on understanding current themes and times. I often take notes and draw abstract interpretations of situations I have observed and then circle back to them when I have a background that I feel connects with the subject matter. So I'd like to, to keep today's um, artist talk very informal, where um, you could just um, raise your hand and ask questions throughout the whole session. And I'd like to keep it more informal than keep it really formal. So just go ahead, raise your hand, and ask me questions whenever you want. I'm trying to keep this to four main topics, give you a short story, give you my influences my early work and transition to abstracts, and my current ideas and processes. So here we go. Story. Now that's me when I was, I would say, 16 or 17. And uh, behind me is my version of Turner's Ship in the Storm. When I, was, uh, when I was that age, I took a fascination to Turner and William Blake. And I tried really hard to reinterpret their paintings in my own colors and have them speak my message. So I'm from Bombay. I was born in Mumbai. And um, my earliest memories of art have been painting and drawing while my mom worked jobs. Um, I was raised by a single mom, and so she had to work a lot to keep, me, keep us both going. And I spent time at daycares and you know all that stuff. 
And so I spend a lot of time waiting and drawing. And that's how I remember my childhood. Um, art was a big inspiration for me. As I got to my school years, my art teacher got, she was really instrumental in bringing out my art even more, where she took me to all these school competitions where they would have, you know, in Bombay, back in the day, in the 80s, there was only competitions. The way you knew you were good was if you went to a competition and you succeeded. That's how you knew you were good. So they had all these inter-school competitions where they would have kids come up and, you know, draw, and they would, you know, um, jury them on the spot and choose a winner. And so I would go to these shows every year from grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, and I always loved these, I loved these competitions. I loved to go out there and like paint in public, and it was fun for me. But at the same time, it, it also instilled, instilled in me a, a confidence about my art. I felt like I was painting, I was doing something that, you know, was appreciated, and for a kid, um, that was great. So I, I would go home and I would, you know, ask mom for more colors and, you know, uh, could I have, you know, these watercolors? Could I have this brush? And of course, we couldn't afford the colors and stuff. So I'd get some colors. And my favorite hobby back then was going to an art store and looking at all the colors and then picking out one or two that I could buy at month's end, you know, with pocket money. Anyways, so that was how um, an early introduction to art through my school system was really important for me, and I think teachers are essential in that process as well. Um, as I grew older, um, you know, life took on, and in my teenage years, I had a choice to make whether to pursue art, which I loved, or to, you know, kind of make a living with doing jobs and, you know, being a single only son to a single mom. And I tried a few shows when I was younger. I had got a few shows when I was younger as well. But I could see very clearly that this would not be a feasible pathway going forward to have a career. So I changed gears and I took on graphic design. Um, and this was back then when Photoshop 3 was first invented. It was out there, it was Photoshop 3, there was no layers, no masking, you know, it was pretty, pretty basic line, baseline Photoshop. And, um, I remember loving how immediate it was. It was so immediate because it was no color mixing, it was no, you know, no palette knife, there was no colors in the, in the house going all over the place. There was no expenses, it was just a computer and a mouse and I could use all these colors and try new art and this was fascinating for me. So I, I dove full in into design and in no time I was doing my friend's um, annual reports and I was doing school reports and doing covers for school projects and stuff and, and so, that became my, my core competency over time, is graphic design. And I kind of always kept painting to never lose track of my art, which I love, you know, which is my first love before design. But I always felt like art, art always spoke to design. When I would paint and create art, my design would improve, you know. My design work would look better, and that's how I felt it progressed. So over the years, then I got into filmmaking, I got into photography, and that got me to Canada on a scholarship when I was 23. Um, when I came here, I had then now the immigrant life to complete, where you know, you're an immigrant and you're struggling to make ends meet. And so I took on graphic design as a career, but I always kept painting in the background to make sure that I never lost touch with you know, art and paint and the feeling of painting and the feeling of having paint on canvas, which brings you so much joy. Um, many years passed, and in the last, I would say, 10 years, I got back more into my love for art and expressing. I could see that design was, you know, was good. It took me where I needed to go for a while there, and then I circled back to art again in the last 10 years. And my style has changed a lot in the last 10 years. I had to do a lot of learning because I was self-taught and I had never gone to school because I had to do a job and all those things were playing in the background as well. So I took it upon myself in the last, I would say, five or six years to do a lot of research, um, buy a lot of books, art school books and uh, books, you know, design books. And I would see all these um, art schools in New York. They would list all the books, their required reading online. 
So I'd go online, I'd, I'd get these books from Amazon and read these books to get an idea of what was happening in the schools and what they were teaching in terms of form or, you know, um, master class in, um, in, in figure drawing and master class in anatomy, color correction, color theory, all those things were, you know, in books as well. So I kind of spent time at nights after finishing my job, um, keeping my skills trying to keep uh, in touch with art and see what's going on and trying to improve my skills. So that's where, that's where I left off till about 2000 and I would say 15 or 14 is when I really got into, you know, really focused on creating work that was my own voice. So I'll show you how that progressed now. My earlier influences were Turner was a big influence. And I think what I liked about Turner was the fact that his paintings had movement. I, I love, you can see my work here, I love movement. I, I think it came from back then where I was really impressed with the way he was, he was moving things around to give you, to give the mast, the little flag on top, a central point of focus where all, your, all the motions around the painting bring your eye back to the central mast, which is in trouble because the ship is in a storm. Um, Nebuchadnezzar from William Blake was one of my earliest recollections of um, a figure in an abstracted environment because I knew this was not coming from a Christian uh, background. I knew the story of Nebuchadnezzar pretty well, but I'd never seen a, you know, I had the biblical photographs, but I'd never seen an, an idea that was so different and so abstracted with the claws and almost like a caveman. So this was really interesting to me back then. And as I progressed, I, I found Vincent van Gogh, and I loved Durin. Durin's, Durin's fauvism, his, his movement in color, his movement of you know, his shapes and the abstraction of, of all the elements that he has put together, but also how the colors work together and how you know, the oranges didn't dominate because the greens were just enough and the purples were just enough. Same thing with, uh, with Vincent van Gogh's work. The movement I loved. I loved all his movements. I loved how his backgrounds were completely abstracted and how his figures stood out, but also in a way were abstracted. So that went on for a while. And as I you know, proceeded, I found Basquiat and I found Winston Homer. And I think to this day, my work sits between these two. <laughs> you know, the fox in the snow, and Basquiat's paintings have, you know, I've, what happened to me was this, that I went to the ROM, or was the AGO, was the AGO, to see Basquiat's show, and I had never seen his paintings in person. I'd, I'd had all his books, I'd seen all his videos, and then I had a chance to go in person and stand in front of his paintings. And that just fundamentally changed my entire thought process, because you see it, and art has a way of talking to you without you knowing it. When you go back and, you know, unpack what you've seen, it can express itself out there really effectively if you give it time. So when I went back, when I saw that show, I spent, you know, I spent so much time trying to understand. I bought his book, of course. I bought his shirt, and I bought his, you know, I bought his fridge magnet, and <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I bought all that stuff, and I, you know, sat with that stuff for a long time, and I read his book every day, and I would not paint. I would just look at his stuff and understand what he was trying to do with his lines and his shapes and his rough edges and his sharp edges and you know why would he put a key in there and of course this sits this sits art sits about the 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 i thought very clearly art his art sat about his messaging which was very personal and a journey that he had gone through as well and he was speaking politically many times through his through his art and i found it fascinating to see the way he would use color and use texture and yet bring out a really serious topic through his work. Now, Winslow Homer, um, on the other hand, was my inspiration for landscapes. And I previously was a landscape, I was a figurative artist. I used to do realist paintings. I would paint uh, faces and my favorite medium was alla prima oil. I loved alla prima oil. I would love to go outside and paint landscapes alla prima. And painting, you know, the fox, I think, still makes an appearance in my paintings currently as well. I, I made a fox painting, I think, last uh, three months ago, and it's a similar silhouette, you know. 
So my current favorites, as you can see now, is a painter from New York called Avery Singer, who, is a, who I just look up to because she's just brilliant to me. She makes these paintings from spray paint and tape, which is mind-boggling to me. And they're, they're eight, nine feet tall, and they're really huge. And then Taylor White, who is, I think, a Marine, an ex-Marine, who makes these paintings from reused material, cardboards and scraps of paper and packaging material and stuff. And he puts them together, and he sews them together. And I love how they're both organized in such different ways. So I think I find inspiration in the fact that if you go back to where I began from, I'm kind of moving forward. My apologies. I'm moving forward towards abstraction just so gradually. So this is a painting I did in 2014. And this was this is my earlier work. And I used to paint oil uh, on canvas. And this is a painting uh, called The Herring Net. One of my favorite works. And this was a gift to my father-in-law, who is here tonight. Um, it was a Christmas gift, because he's a fisherman. And I enjoyed fishing with him. And this painting is about a son and a father fishing together on the high seas and catching fish while there are big sailboats back there that are also on the same waters. But the, the precariousness of this small dinghy and the two paddles up there and the fish that's a massive load of fish um, really spoke to me. So I wanted to make this painting for him as a Christmas gift. So I made this. And this is what I was doing in 2014. And then fast forward, fast forward a few years from then, I was also dabbling in um, computer graphics. So trying to make paintings on the computer with the Wacom stylus. So I had, I had this happening on the analog front, and I had this happening on the digital front. So I made this painting about for, I think it was for Women's Day in, is it 18? Yes, yeah, 18, for, you know, for World Women's Day. And I wanted her to be the star. You know? And this is when I first realized abstraction could start in the background. Because I wanted to put her on a, on a, uh, on a train platform and have the train come by. But the train had you know, the Wonder Woman logos on it. And so I wanted to have some abstraction happening behind her. And so this is when it really began to occur to me that I could abstract my backgrounds or some part of my paintings and make them you know, a mix of two worlds where the abstraction mix in with, mixes in with the you know, figuration or the, you know, just the painting in front. Fast forward a couple more years from that point, I had now developed a style where I had <coughs> paintings of figures but within them were abstracted elements. So you'll see here I have the triangles that you'll see now. But these are all digital. They are not analog, because I didn't have the courage to start this on a canvas yet. Um, this is called the Untamed Cry. And that's called something, it's a Japanese warrior, um, spiritual warrior. But I liked, how, I liked how these paintings worked together in terms of the shapes and there was still a silhouette of a face. There was some messaging happening about a form, about power, you know, about you know, being outside, about having connection to, to different elements. In here, I could see that I had some, I had some animals happening. So I, I thought, OK, how could I put this into an analog painting, where I actually paint this stuff? So my first work, where I actually did a still life, was this work where this was a still life of a wooden statue in my partner's house. And I, for the first time, tried to abstract the background like you see now. Um, this was at a show at the Hamilton Artists, Inc. I think it was at Swarm 2016 or 17, I forget. But this was my first, and I was very happy with this, because it was, you know, it was, OK, this is going to work for me. I'm going to try this out some more. And then came Not One to Follow, which is completely abstracted. This was a person standing with their hands in a pocket. And I thought, I got to completely change this out and make this completely abstracted in my own way. And um, the painting's name is Not One to Follow, which has two meanings. It was basically me trying to rebel against being figurative or being um, perfectionist with my paintings, but also saying, you know, 
this figure is not going to follow. Moving along from that point on, I got more into abstraction and trying to still maintain some sort of figuration in my design. So now I had a face and I had uh, a suggestion of a person sleeping up top with the nose. But again, I wanted to keep it so abstract <coughs> that you were not able to figure out what was what unless you spend some time looking at it. And I, I wanted to have the feeling of where you come to my painting and you spend some time and it reveals more layers and reveals more stuff, reveals more um, figures or messages to you over time and not something that's more immediate that you can just walk away from and kind of get what the idea of the painting was. The big change for me happened just after but I made, I thought to myself, so I've done all this, I've done these abstracted paintings now and I felt like doing something completely different and going completely abstract. And this was the result of that process. This is called um, Compulsive Shopper. Because I was at uh, No Frills and I was really hungry after work and I was shopping and my cart was just full of yellow stuff. It was just full of yellow stuff with all the yellow labeling and the packaging. And I, f I felt a, a need to resolve that memory with a painting. So when I made this painting, I wasn't sure what I was doing. I, I kept it hidden for a long time. And then there was a call at the Hamilton Artist Inc. on James Street North. And they had a call for the Cannon Gallery for a show. And you know, I, I didn't think I love the gallery space there. I've always been there. I've been going there for inspiration. I love that space. I love the people there. I love the work there. And that's my second home, I say. I'm always there. You know, I'm always looking around at what's happening out there. So I said, you know, OK, let's give it a try and submit some paintings and see what happens as a complete leap of faith. And my first instinct was to send you know, my other ones that were more figurative and more you know, landscape or you know, um, foxes and all that stuff. And, and I chose not to, and I chose to send this one instead. And I heard back from them saying, yes, you'll have a show. And this for me was a big milestone because I felt like, you know, you know, as an artist who's self-taught, you're always second guessing where you fit in terms of the hierarchy of artists who are taught in professional you know, organizations, which I would have loved in the first place, but my choices were different. Um, so you always kind of figure out, fi figuring out where you fit inside those those layers of artists who are working really hard and doing different things and going to school and you know um, doing in practice and where you are at home at night making this stuff. So for me, it was a big jump in terms of my confidence where I felt like if a gal gallery like the Hamilton Artist Inc. is able to take me on for a show with this painting, I should pursue this even more. And so that's what happened. I really uh, dove in head along after this point on and then came so my show was scheduled to be at the Artist Inc. at, uh, it was April of 2021. And this was made in the April of 2020. And that's when COVID happened. And so when COVID happened, my design work went to a standstill because I was losing clients and I was not giving a lot of money and uh, business was quiet. I had still had a few clients that I was working with, but it was quiet. And there was no, there was no, you know, activities, there was no sports, there was no parties to go to, there was no festivals to go to. So it was quiet. So I spent some time making work in those, in those years. And is that, that's when I found my current voice that you see here um, that helped me make a body of work over time and gave me confidence to you know, create more art that was abstracted but also, in a way, figurative. That's why I call it, ab what do I call it? I call it figurative abstraction. So kind of taking figuration and blending it just enough to have the concept come through, but have it abstracted. So your first view of it is abstraction. And again, any questions, just raise your hand and we'll, you know, we'll have a QA. and a um, Current ideas and my process at the moment is really, it goes all over the place. There's no, set, there's no set rule. There's no set way of doing things. I usually start with a bunch of 
sketches, and I'll um, make many of these. And from these comes, these are just basic, you know, notepad sketches, and I, and I find they talk to me in terms of where my paint should go and how my paint should flow and how my stroke should fit. If there's a crosshatch, there could be diamonds in there, you know, or bigger diamonds or lines. Now that is a coffin, actually. That's supposed to be a coffin with oars. And this painting was supposed to be called You Are Many Oars. You know, kind of going towards, going from, you know, from everything you have to nothing at the end of life. You'll also find in my paintings, there'll be a circle on top. In all my paintings, you'll see circles. And that's my, my love for physics and the sun. I think um, the sun is a vital part of my paintings. And I find all my paintings have a message that we are all connected by nature. And we are connected by the sun that shines, that shines around us for our entire existence. I mean, we can't forget the fact that we're all just sitting on a big circular rock, flying around in space around a big light, right? And so for me, that's a reminder to remind me of the process of being an artist, to be creative and to be, you know, just put my voice out there. When I start my paintings, I'll take a concept like this. And then I'll go onto the computer and try and hash out a few sketches. So here's a sketch that I made for a painting. So at this point, I have no, no idea of what the painting is called. I just have an idea of the color scheme. And what I do is the background of the painting is, is made on a canvas. So what I'll do is I'll go to a canvas and I'll paint over it in a very expressionist way, because I love that movement as well. Um, I'll pour paint, and I'll scrape paint off, and I'll you know, pour some more paint. And I have this really big canvas of lines and colors with no content on top. I'll take that back to the computer, create a design on top that could work out as a roadmap. But eventually, yeah? Is that acrylic on your painting? This is just on a computer. Yeah, no, but I mean when you, when you go. The first layer is acrylic. And then I go to oil after that. First layer is water, because uh, it's sometimes on a raw canvas. So I want to seal the canvas off and then work on oil on top of it. But that's just a roadmap. And then when that roadmap is set, the actual painting comes out to be this. This is a big jump in what the roadmap was and what the painting becomes eventually. Because you know, paint has a way of taking you on a journey. And a, a graphic interface cannot replicate that feeling of you know, oil paint touching the canvas and you moving it around and, and feeling the love and you know, getting tired and exhausted by squatting and standing up and you know, taping stuff. And it's just, it's just different mediums. But this, this stage is just completely an idea of how I would like a painting to start. And from that point on, I switch over to analog, which is acrylic and oils on canvas. The first layer is acrylic, and then I go I'll make a few more layers in acrylic, and then I'll go on oil on top. Um, here's another example. You can guess this painting. This is how this painting began. And that's how it ended, right there. So that's how those two have looked together. So the fact that in this painting, for example, this is called um, Land of Bay. And in this painting, I began this painting as a connection between my two homes, my home in Hamilton, which is the land of the Tiger Cats, <laughs> and the land that I come from that has tigers in it. Right? So the painting was sort of a, a connection to the two worlds where the Tiger Cat connected with me and also the coconut trees and the feeling of warmth and the feeling of rain dripping down on your forehead, those nostalgic elements were, you know, I wanted to put those things on a canvas and try and connect those two worlds together. And which is why it's called the Land of Bay, which is the bay where I live at Bayfront Park, and the Land of Bay, which is Bombay, Mumbai. Um, so this painting was made for that reason. And then as the painting kept progressing forward, it kept changing, because that was my first initial idea. And in this, 
idea you'll see there is um, there are I don't know if you can see it clearly there are horses <coughs> there are chess pieces that are pushed around making forming the eye now one part about me also is that I love chess I love I love how chess works in life I love how chess is a part of our existence in terms of how we navigate our lives I find chess is metaphorical in a way that you know you, you keep the stuff that you love safe by building walls around it by building pawns or you know having your rooks or your knights attack to keep the stuff you loved really safe and so um, for me when you when you actually sit down and look at a chessboard when you see a chessboard from from up top it might look like squares but when you sit down on a chessboard it transforms into these beautiful diamonds at eye level. And so that's where you see a lot of these harlequin motifs in my paintings are from basically a chessboat, a tiger navigating his way through um, you know, time or a place. The, tree, the trees are also built from diamonds and they are in a way attached to the tiger as he moves or as the tiger moves forward, giving the, the figure in the painting thoughts and you know, feelings and ideas and the connection with the tiger at the bottom is always there. Any questions? What about the sailboat? You see a sailboat? It yeah, it's, yeah, it's traveling the oceans and uh, um, coming across to a different country. You know? it's, it's all those elements of um, trying to put all those pieces together in one painting. So when you see a painting over time, they reveal layers to you. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Um, what wasn't working for you in this iteration? And then you moved to this one. So can you remember? What yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you what happens, really. Like, this is when I start. This is my idea to start the painting. And then I'll go to the canvas. So this background here was made on canvas on acrylic. Now, this section here was placed on a computer on top as an idea. But the moment I take this to the canvas, I start, I pull my paints out, I mix my paints, and I start the process, it changes instantly. The whole idea is just, is just a roadmap to start you off, really. And this is where I think sometimes uh, there is some confusion about how I make my paintings. Do I actually copy? Uh, a digital design onto a canvas, which I never do, because it never, it never happens. It just does not, it doesn't work that way for me. It doesn't work because I just can't do it. So I began painting this. I had my screen up, and so I have an idea. So I, my first choice, my first layer was these blocks, right? And the moment I had the blocks done, I chose to make the blocks black instead of green. And that was my first change in the design that I had planned. Now, once I made the blocks black, now the rest of the painting had to come together with, that, with those blocks, with, you know, with, the, with the black blocks. Yeah, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> oh, it's funny because I just re I didn't realize there was still space on the right until just now. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there, is, there are different faces looking different places. And usually I work in threes. I, I like painting in threes. I'll do three paintings. I'll do a triptych, you know. So when that happened, I mean, this was the face. You'll see the face here. So I kept the face intact with a smile. But I changed the, the squares to, you know, a blacker square, which meant that my entire design had to change then. So I had, you know, to adjust. And then this was a big change, because I, I don't usually have a, a name for my paintings when I start the work. Um, that comes through a process of just, you know, thinking about the painting after a month that it's done. You keep it, you keep it going for a while. You look at it for a while, and you just, you know, stop painting, and then you just look at it and get, you know, ideas about where it should fit inside, um, where it should fit inside your repertoire of names. I do love naming my paintings, and I find I, um, I have a list on Word and I have an Excel sheet, and I have five, six names for a single painting, and I, and I put them down, and I keep circling back and seeing which painting, over time, which name fits that painting the best. And this was you know, Land of Bay. 
And I also removed, I removed the horse from the face and I removed the crocodile from the face, from the painting as well. And I changed it to a tiger because when I had the black on the, on the canvas, it instantly spoke to me about the tiger cats. It just said, oh, this is a tiger cat color. So I had to go with that. Let's make a connection between those two worlds now. And so that's how I proceeded further. Yeah. Um, okay, so some comments and some questions. Yeah. Um, when I'm looking at this from here, it really reminds me of like inlaid wood, the way you put the pieces together, almost like a puzzle. Yeah. So I find that interesting that even though it's, there's a, uh, you've overlapped, that it looks like the pieces are side by side. Yeah. Like a puzzle. So I find that interesting. Um, I was trying really hard to listen to that presentation and I, I, and I thought I heard you say something maybe about landscapes or I, I don't know, maybe I just was thinking it because the, the more abstract lines that look like a fingerprint or maybe they're wood grain or maybe mm -hmm. they're a topographical mm -hmm. map. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about those. Yeah. Because I see that you do a lot of control straight lines with masking. Um, how do you do those so evenly? And are they based on any of those things? Yes, absolutely. Good observation. I, those, those lines you see there, uh, it's in my presentation as well in the video. I, I put those lines in to mimic fingerprints. Okay. So it is our human touch on all the stuff that we, you know, that we come in contact with. We leave a mark as human beings. And, and the lines are basically fingerprints or sound waves passing through a plane. So all those lines are, you know, um, yeah, just fingerprints of wood grains, just growth over time. Um, and it does have a sexual element to it as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, which part of it? <laughs> well, that's what I see. Maybe everybody sees it now. <laughs> and another thing, <laughs> another question observation. So I'm looking that you do, uh, you pointed out the other faces, the kind of abstract face on the right, but um, all of these are profiles. Is there a reason why you're gravitating towards a profile that fills the whole space? Yes, I, I feel like um, I want to speak about headspace and literally headspace and I want the head to occupy the entire space that there is and give power to your thoughts you know and you know just being just being having a journey as an immigrant you know I learned to be quiet for a long time about stuff just to be kind of take it in and not speak back or not you know not retaliate or not um, question stuff and so Later on in life, as I kept painting, that's what painting does. It kind of frees you. It frees your mind space. It lets you express your thoughts really openly. And so I felt like my canvases should fill the thoughts that I have completely from edge to edge. Um, the, by the way, your, about your point about the lines, straight lines, I, I'll use masking tape in some instances, but I also use a ruler and on a brush and just go straight down. But I kind of mix and match those two, so there's variation between the straight lines and the, the jagged edges between different parts. They kind of move forward and back. And so the fingerprints, I might have said it wrong, I was in, in another world. Um, did you paint over top and then scratch those lines? Mm-hmm. Okay. So what I do is I, when I had this figure, um, I had this background before. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I drew out so before I had this, uh, I drew out the figure around it, and uh, it was yellow. It was a yellow background, and I poured black paint over it, and then I scraped out the black paint in, form, in the form of a face, or some sort of face. So that I'd, It kind of matches the ear, or you know, it looks good in terms of how things are moving by the chin, and by the nose, it's kind of horizontal, so it's not going down, you know? So you kind of, scrape the paint off in a way that your idea is progressing. Um, then you have just the background. And then it's photography. You take a photo of it, go back to the computer, try out little ideas, and come back with the canvas again, and try them on the canvas. And then the canvas will change your direction. You go back on the computer again. That's a, a lot of back and forth and back and forth. And then it gives you, that gives me a voice 
I think between those two worlds where the idea bounces around between the analog and digital worlds, I find the median line is where I find my voice for the piece. Um, and I get, to know, I get to know where the piece is going from that point on to take it further. But after that point as well, once, once you start getting into it, it just goes wherever it wants. You, there's no control, right? It just goes, it takes its own life now from that point on. Yes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's subconscious. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. These are definitely mindscapes, and well, you know, I, I feel like hearing that from you is a recognition of exactly what I try and present in my paintings. It's, it's the struggle that you have to go through that it's on the paintings. I don't think I would have these paintings if I didn't go through the struggle, you know. I think the struggle is what makes the, the painting valid, where you have, you have a collection of memories that you can pull from and find inspiration to push yourself further and try and create art that can connect with people at different levels. I think it's, so, it's also so metaphysical where it's not, you know, there's no real science behind what you paint and what people take away from your paintings. You just have to do the work. You know, you do the work, you make the paintings, you, make, you work hard, and let the paintings do the talking, really. That's what I believe. And when I'm painting, I'm thinking about these, you know, the struggle of being in Hamilton when I first came to Hamilton from Toronto, um, not having friends, being solitary, trying to make friends as an older, older man when you had friends in Mumbai and friends in Toronto, and then trying to find your space in a new city with new people, with a new type of thinking, you know. Those, those struggles are etched in your mind, and as you paint, when you have a concept, you try and pour those feelings out on the paint and try and, you know, scrape off layers, revealing layers of yourself in a way, um, layers that interact with other layers, you know, to form better layers, beautiful layers, or not. So all those, all those uh, human experiences are kind of represented on the canvas, you know, in a metaphorical idea. Yes? Do you use Procreate through your program? No, I use uh, Photoshop. Oh. Yeah, I've been a Photoshop fan since I was 16. <laughs> it's been a while. I first got into Photoshop at Photoshop 3.0 when when I first got into design, I remember this really well. Um, I was this new kid with a computer, and there were people who were designing labels with um, light tables, and they used to have these, you know, masks and photographs on top, cameras on top, and they would take photographs and cut them out and place them, glue them, and you know, draw the alphabets with a with a with a brush and photograph them. And those were the plates that went to the printing press to create labels and in I came I came in with this computer to create what they made in you know four or five days in half an hour and they did not like me you know back <laughs> then <laughs> they I got some stares back then as a kid and I was like oh you know this is going to be a rough ride but you know eventually that was going to happen and now you know seeing where I am today I, I I dabble with AI you know I love technology I'm a technologist I'm a futurist as well um, I dabble in AI and I see what AI does today and I feel like the same way I felt back when I was 16, because it's moved so far ahead now in terms of, you know, what's the program that, um, uh, I forget the name right now. What's that? No, I forget the name. I was doing it last night, uh, mid uh, something. Anyways, it's an AI program that basically works on your prompt. So you give it a prompt. Yeah, yeah. You give it a prompt and you say, I want, uh, 
photo, photo realistic person with a pipe smoking a cigar or sitting on a, on a, on a couch in, uh, on a beach and out pops the exact thing you asked for. And all you gave it was prompts. So this is where you know the journey has been so long where Photoshop has been my mainstay for so long. I've actually worked really hard to scale back my technology to keep it a bit more real because it's easy to get lost in tech and kind of get the best technology. So my setup is actually, I would say, eight years old. But my, my stylus is eight years old. My tablet is eight years old. So it creates resistance in terms of creating art. You know? Okay. Yeah. Well, how long would you spend on, on your call with your digital craft or your digital design? Probably uh, an evening. Yeah, I would say I sit. The main work is I love being on the canvas in the studio. The digital part of it is just a, a segue to kind of formulate ideas so that I have, it excites me also, because I'm using my tech skills with my you know, analog practice. It gives me a chance to just kind of enjoy the painting in a new way on a screen, kind of zoom in and look at it and you know, have fun with that texture. They, they are works of art as well. I have multiple versions. This version, this is the first basic version. I probably have about 15 more of the same painting in different stages and different ideas. And when you start out on the analog version, are you, are you, are you looking at that graph, or you just put it away and then start? And then start <coughs> and down? Is, it, is it your guide from, your, from the outset, or do you just kind of put it away and say, OK, let's start? It, at some point, I just put it away. It goes, it goes away pretty quickly. And then from that point on, the painting takes over and completes almost itself. You know, when I come back home at night, uh, you know, I sleep at night, I think about exactly what to do the next day with the painting. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The voice that I find, I find this is a magical space where I find is when I'm working on a painting, if I go back here, for example, and these two, um, when I had this, you know, when you're using a stylus, it is not, it, you cannot go deep inside the philosophy of what those shapes are. You know, it's more, it's just, it's on the surface, it's superficial, it's not really connecting deep inside, you know. When I go on the canvas, I pick up a brush, those shapes just go away completely. They're just gone completely from my, from my painting because the canvas then tells you, you know, the art, the, the, the paint tells you that those shapes will not work in this context. And so there's a, there's a shift in the philosophy of how I'm thinking about the painting on the analog side and how I am doing it on the digital side. So I know these are just roadmaps to kind of find ideas. And like, for example, this, section here, the red section, made its way to the painting. But again, it's modified from what I had first designed it as. Um, yeah, they, they, they talk to each other, but they're not good friends. <laughs> oh, they, yeah, there's tons and tons. I think I have, I have a Dropbox account with 10, 100 GB, and it's full of just test, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, test, final, X, 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 final, X, X, yes. <laughs> yes. Maybe it would be kind of cool to do like a digital flip book. Yes, I, yeah, I've thought about that for sure, like getting all those pieces out as well. Get those pieces out. I've been, I've heard this many times, like we'd love to see your digital work, and then there's so many of them, it's daunting to even go back and check you know, I feel like when I, fin when I finish this painting, I feel relieved that it's, it's done. Because when I go through these files, there are s it's folders over folders of different designs, and you, know, you can get lost in those, right? It takes a while to kind of contemplate what's happened, and then, yeah. I was <laughs> I, my analogy is, is a, a teapot, you know, the teapot, when it's boiling, you, know, you can hear it boiling, you can hear it boiling and boiling and boiling, it's a very abstract analogy, but it works for me. When it starts whistling, 
it's, it's done. The tea is, you know, the pot is ready. Like, take it off the stove and, you know, pour a glass, cup of tea. Uh, I, find, I find, like, a point comes where I can do no more in the painting. I cannot improve it. I cannot take away from it. And I feel like it's also a leap of faith where I have to go, okay, that's enough. I've worked enough on these paintings now, this especially. This is, for me, now where I want this to exist. However, I'll say this also, that paintings in my studio are not safe. You know, they're not safe because when I have, yeah, when I have them in the studio, I will overpaint my paintings if I feel like the need to paint over them, you know. <laughs> um, it's happened a lot, actually. Yes? How was your experience at Projecto? At? Projecto Toronto. The oh, Project Toronto, yeah, the artist project yeah. was fantastic. Good. It's, a, it's a riot. It's a lot of work. But it's also great to meet. I think that's one of the key features that I love the most about that place. It's a lot of work for me and my family and my kids and you know, all my support system to get out there for three nights and prepare for it and do all that stuff. But being out in front of people three days, half starved, half slept, you know, talking about art is just fun. And there are people who are not in your social space, who, have not, who don't know who you are, who are you know, not artists or they're just buyers or you know, just collectors walking by or strolling by you know, and talking to you about work that they see that they like. And I love that input. I love hearing their voices and seeing what they think about work, what they see if it relates to what I made as an intention. You know. um, it talks to me a lot. And I, I really enjoy that you know, Q&A with people who are completely random from I don't know where. right? Um, it was good in terms of sales were good, uh, made great connection with galleries and yeah, a, a lot of camaraderie with fellow artists, you know, you kind of, you know, work together, you make new friendships and they all know you now after two years, I've been there two years now, uh, I did last year as well, it was my first year last year, it was nerve wracking. I told, I told my partner who's here, I said, you know what, it's a leap of faith, let's see what happens, I'm going to put my paintings out there, I have no clue what's going to happen, I have a couple couple of paintings that I'll, you know, and they were all different. They were not made for a show. So I put them out there, and the sales were great. The response was great. And it kind of propels you as well. You need that feedback from someone outside your circle that doesn't know you or doesn't know your work or your struggle for a long time, right? Well, that's how I found it, just through that. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, this, was it this year or last year? Uh, this year. OK. Yeah. Were you there at the <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I have, um, I have a plan for the show. I'm really excited about the show coming up. Um, I'm doing um, some different stuff that I haven't done before. So here you'll see a lot of figuration. For the new stuff that I'm doing, it's completely abstract. So there's no figuration in the, in the paintings. There's no, they're just abstract scapes, landscapes, abstract nightscapes, oceanscapes, uh, a connection to nature in a way, humanscapes, just scapes of different kind, woodscapes, but they're all I would say uh, figure free, with no figures in them really. Just completely, and they're large and they're exciting because it's a good break away for me from you know, my structured design. I want to break away from the same going back and forth to design. And one piece I made more recently was called Forest. And it's a 60 by 60 square. And I did that for my solo show at the Assembly Gallery uh, last month. And this was my first time that I worked on the ground, just on a raw canvas, with no ideas, no preconceived uh, planning. It was just completely raw on the canvas, pouring paint on my knees, up again. And I really enjoyed that. It was a good break from you know, going bouncing back and forth between a machine and a canvas. It was just freeing to be you know, throwing paint down and scraping it off completely intuitively. So I'll try and bring that uh, in many ways for the show. Any other questions? Absolutely, absolutely. Does the canvas ever disappoint you or rip? Or I work on, on hardboard, and um, I'm thinking the way you scrape different levels. Like, is that? I've learned. I've learned to love it. <laughs> there have been there have been a lot of mistakes and a lot of yeah, a lot of tears in the past. 
No, I haven't tried that yet. I, I have tried hardboard. I love panel because yeah. it's so good. Yeah. It's just so good. It's so expensive. It's hard to transport. You know, it's hard to. Uh, I also sell work online, and so shipping goes up, and you know, all that stuff happens. And mm -hmm. it's great, though. Like it's great. But over time, I've learned to scrape gently. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, not really a question, but more of sort of an observation. Um, you said you said it a couple times, but early on you said a lot of it was about the connection between humans and nature. Yes. One thing. So that was sort of in the back of my mind, looking at all these uh, figures of, of portrait, you know, so it's profile images. It's, it's interesting because they kind of obviously they're a profile portrait, but also each face incorporates almost as landscape elements. Yes. So Yes. Good point. Yes. Yeah. Good point. I, yeah. It's a it's a conscious. There's you know there's so many more paintings I could show you. Um, there's a conscious thought of involving and bringing in nature, the light. Um, this, this for example is um, an idea growing as a flower, rising through the figure that's here. Um, now this painting is. Exactly that. It's a it's a it's a headscape. This is called um, "You Are Many Moves," and this was based upon my love for chess. And in 1996, there was a game between Gary Kasparov, the then world champion, and a machine called IBM Deep Blue. And IBM Deep Blue beat Kasparov. And for me, as a kid, this was a big moment in my life. I was like, "Wow, a machine beat a human being in chess," you know. And so that stuck with me. And so. For me, this, the head incorporates a punch in the face, which is the red seat, which is how Deep Blue beat Kasparov, who was trapped under Deep Blue's play, by bringing on a horse. So you can't see it here, but there's actually a horse in there as well, a real life horse in there. So you're exactly right. There is, every head has some part of nature in it um, contained as an idea. That painting there has a bird of sorts you know, that's about to take off for a flight. It has horns of a bull. The figure has horns of a bull, because that painting is called Silently. And it's, uh, it's a painting about being the most loud person inside, but silently outside. Where the, your thoughts are what keeps you powered up. It's not your voice outside, it's your thoughts inside could you know, keep you, keep you uh, fueled, in a way. So it's about stubbornness, it's about it's about passion, about love, about you know, about calculation. But again, there is there is the element of nature, which is the bull, the stubbornness in there. And these are some way in some ways these are reflections of myself probably in all these paintings. Yes? Yeah, I would love that. Yes, go to smokestack and you know yeah. work with. That. Yeah. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. I, that would be really I just cool. haven't. Yeah, I haven't got to that point yet. Mm -hmm. I would. You know, my background when I first my first job was in a printing press, mm -hmm. so I know that process really well. Like I know exposing plates and you know printing stuff and whatnot. So that would be a fun adventure to go have eight layers, have them all superimposed, and oh, that's fun. Yeah, fun to look forward to. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. <laughs>